and you, conduct disorder is really, I think of it as the childhood version of antisocial personality disorder. And it's based mainly on behavior more than it is personality. So these are kids who are less than 15, and they tend to do things like um, have aggression, to, uh, they are aggressive towards people or animals. Animals is kind of a common thing. They have, they have fire setting behavior, they destroy property, they're deceitful and they, they steal. So it's all the same kind of stuff as an antisocial personality disorder person would have as an adult, but it started when they were younger than 15. And then it's called conduct disorder, really, instead of a personality disorder. Um, these folks don't have much empathy for others. They're kind of arrogant, opinionated, cocky, self-centered. Um, these, are, these aren't very kind words to describe this, but this is kind of what, how these folks present. They end up getting um, put in jail, as I mentioned. And incidentally, you might think, boy, I'd know one of these folks right off the bat. You know, it'd be easy to tell. Remember how Dallas was kind of uh, a little bit charming, a little bit, uh, you know, he's kind of a con man, right? These folks are like that. I mean, they, they, they'll get in with you and they act like you're, they're your best friend, and next thing you know, they stab you in the back and they're gone, you know? And so they can be a little bit tough to, it's hard to know until you really get a good history on the person whether they have this or not. They're more likely to die by violent means, either from getting in fights or from suicide, things like that. Um, and again, they, they tend to have other brain illnesses or personality disorders that involve, per, that involve per, uh, impulse control problems, sort of, sort of things like uh, substance abuse uh, or pathologic gambling. They tend to have issues like that. It's more common in men, like 3% versus 1% of women in the general population. There is a genetic, call, a genetic link to this, by the way. If there's a family member that has it, there's a higher risk of, the person, of a child you know, growing up to have it. Um, now, now, let's think for just a second. Again, this is one, and incidentally, there's no medicaid, really for any of these, there's not much of a medication treatment for these things. So, psychotherapy you can do for this, but it doesn't do a lot of good. I mean, these folks aren't motivated for psychotherapy. You've got to kind of be motivated to want to change your behavior. These folks, like, like a lot of us, we don't see the issue. They don't see the issue in themselves. It's everybody else that's the problem, not me. So how do you get somebody in psychotherapy to do anything with them with that? You really can't. It's hard. That's why a lot of these folks end up in jail. Um, I'm going to talk about something a little controversial here. There are a lot of people who think, again, remember we talked about the stigma that when you don't understand something, you kind of stigmatize it? This is a brain illness, guys. I mean, this is a, we are who we are kind of what our brain makes us, right? You know, these folks, they've gotten this way somehow. Right? They're not, it's not like they're just consciously deciding to do all this on purpose. Right? I, I don't, I, most of them probably not. I'm not saying everybody. You know, there's probably are some people that do. But they're starting to get to the point where we can, we can actually identify in the brain what gives a person, what gives a person their conscience. You know, what gives all of us our sort of morals. Okay? These folks don't have that. So there's something wrong in that part of the brain that, that, that gives them their morals. Right? Um, and that's kind of fascinating to me. You know, that's getting to the, to the core of who we are a little bit and, and pointing to the brain as, as part of it. The other way we know that is because there are some, uh, you can have a person who doesn't have a certain personality. This is sort of in general about personality and how do we know it's in the brain. First of all, I mean, it kind of has to be. I don't worry, it's not in the heart, I don't think. It's not in the stomach. But, um, but how do we know that, you know, that, that the function of the brain affects it, right? You guys ever heard of uh, folks having brain injuries, maybe a car accident, and then after that, they're not the same anymore? Did you ever notice that? You ever know anybody like that or having a stroke or even Alzheimer's disease? These are illnesses that have damaged the brain in different parts of the brain. And these folks aren't the same after that. You know, mom's not mom anymore. She's somebody else. I don't recognize who she is. That's because there's damage to parts of the brain that, that gave her part of her personality, if not all. I mean, that made her who she was. Um, there's a really interesting story, a guy named Phineas Gage, I don't know if you guys have ever heard of this guy, it was back, I can't remember when, 1918, or it was a long time ago, and, and this, um, this gentleman worked on the railroad, and they had these things called tamping rods, and, uh, and I don't fully understand what they were, but there was gunpowder behind it, and it was a big piece of metal rod, and then something went awry, and this poor guy got a, got a metal tamping rod shoved right through his brain, I forget which side now, it went up through the orbit and came out up here basically caused a frontal lobotomy on this guy. Um, cut off his frontal lobes from the rest of his, blood, the rest of his brain. Um, completely changed his personality. And, and it's really interesting because before that, he was 
he worked on the railroad. He was a dependable worker. He was there all the time, all the time. Did a good hard day's work. After that, and he, you know, he didn't curse. He was he, he was a pretty he was not an impulsive aggressive guy. And then after that, he was an impulsive aggressive guy. He was cursing. He was you know just talking like a sailor. He would not show up to work on time. He could you know he basically lost a bunch of jobs. And the doctor that first treated him kind of followed him along his life really, and he, he died prematurely. Um, and I forget now how he died, but. Um, this guy followed him all along, and the guy kind of he went all over the country, basically trying to get jobs and relationships with work and all. He basically lost who he was. He wasn't the same guy anymore, and it was all because his you know frontal lobes got cut off from the rest of his brain, and he was he was different. Um, so this tells you that personality is part of our brains, and again, we got to protect our brains, right? We don't we don't we like who we are. At least I hope we, sh we should all like who we are, and. Um, it's you don't want to have strokes, you know. You don't want to have Alzheimer's. You got to exercise. You got to do all the stuff you do for your heart. You got to do it for your brain. And um, any questions about antisocial personality disorder? Give you a lot of stuff. Yeah. Don't you think that personality is also a, a gene sort of thing? That not only that, but it's repetitious of what your parent do when you were a child and how you. Um, it's environmental, but it's more than just environmental. Correct. Because they have gotten that from their family, right. their, their uh, relatives. Right, that, that's true. Yeah, like I said earlier, it's, it's, it's a combination of the genetic piece, which probably is the temperament part. It's, that's the best guess I can make. It's the temperament part. It's like kind of, it's kind of how your, your blueprint reads. Um, but the thing is, your environment shapes your brain. So, like you're saying, you know, you, you have a certain genetic uh, makeup that you're born with, temperament or, or something, let's say, and then whatever happens around you shapes your brain from that point on. So you start with with this, whatever that is, okay? Maybe it's shy and timid or inhibited. That's what you start with. You start with, huh? The thing. Yeah, well, you start with something. I mean, you start, you know, every, you, you guys know this, right? Even infants that can't talk. Some are very, you know, into everything all the time, active, that kind of stuff. Some are just content to sit and lay and, you know, look at this, something above them or whatever. There are differences in infants, right, from There's a very good job. There's not a gene job. that's involved? There's not one particular gene that we, be, that we can isolate that says this is what, you know, this gene is going to give you this temperament. No. It's probably too complicated than that. It's more complicated than that. Really, none of the psychiatric, the brain illnesses are that way. And it's probably just because they're so complicated. You know, there are a few things in, in the brain that where you have, there are some, you know, but not many. When you think of all the different things that can go wrong, very few of them are, can be linked to one gene that would cause all of it. One example of that, and it's not really one gene, but it's a sequence of, uh, on the DNA, is Huntington's disease. That's something that's genetic, and we've isolated exactly what causes that. We can't do much about it at this point, but we know exactly what causes it. It's, it's totally it's a genetic thing. You inherit it, you have it. If you don't inherit it, you don't have it. So that one's easy, but that's very it's, it's uncommon for it to be that easy. Um, I wish it were better. You know, she was different than that, but because it would be easier, then we wouldn't be so much there wouldn't be so much stigma, right? If you could explain it, if I could tell you, if I could put your picture up here and say, okay, when you when you knock out this pr particular part of the brain. This is exactly what you see. And when you knock out this, but the problem is all of us are a little bit different. And um, probably a, partly genetics, partly environment. And what percentage of each, I don't know the answer to that. Some, I would imagine it's different depending on the, the part of the brain and so on, and the genetics. There are some genes, believe it or not, this is kind of interesting. I think we talked about this early on. We talked about neuroplasticity and about you know, how the brain changes with its environment. So the environment can actually switch certain genes on and off in our brain, which then cause certain things, certain proteins to be made and certain connections to be made and such, so that it changes you from that point on. That's kind of fascinating. You know, it's kind of, uh, you, know, you, don't think of it, you don't think of it like that, but you know, we've come a long way. So, any other questions? That's a good one. About any social personality, really any of the ones we see, or histrionic? Okay. The last one I want to cover tonight, is, and I won't be able to, I'm going to have to do this in two parts because there's, uh, there's several others after this that I, I won't have time to cover tonight. But borderline personality disorder is a, kind of a big deal. We'll try to get through that one here in the next few minutes. Um, 